It's mighty good to be back with you. This is a very special place when you consider that this place almost closed in the 90s, when you consider the great diversity here, when you consider the great talent and creativity here, when you consider the authenticity that is here, when you consider, of course, the great love that is here, when you consider all of those things and so much more, it's easy to say that this is a very special place and it's good to be back. Usually when I come back from the summer, I share some stories with you, some adventures, along with some usually funny stories, but I should have known this summer would be different when it started off for me with shingles. I call this my shingles summer. Also, our oldest and most beloved of our dogs, our lab Simon, suddenly stopped walking and eating, and we took her to the vet an umpteenth number of times, and never could quite find out what was wrong, and so we eventually had to put Simon down. And as most of you know, the hardest thing about this summer for me was the illness and death of my uncle, Phil Hunter, who was a great member of this church who will be terribly missed. And for the icing on the cake this summer, one of my teeth decided that it wanted to have a root canal. <laughs> so it was a strange summer break, and some people have said, Billy, it's too bad it all happened on your vacation, to which I say, thank God it happened on my vacation. If I had been working during all of this, I probably would have had a nervous breakdown, and you would have gotten some lousy sermons. Uh, so thank you for giving me, thank you for giving me this wonderful break during part of the summer. My main goal this summer was to finish the book, and as Chris mentioned, it is finished. I've even had five people review it. They've given it the thumbs up, glowing remarks. Their comments will actually be on the book jacket, so I want to thank Sherry, Chelsea, Christy, <laughs> Wendell and Wesley for taking the time to read it. If you're visiting, those are the names of my wife and children. It was actually five other people. I know better than to let my family read it and review it. They would be my harshest critics. In one of the chapters, I tell a story that happened on Sherry's and my honeymoon. And by the way, this is not a romance book. <laughs> you will not be getting any juicy details of the honeymoon. In fact, our honeymoon started off rather awkwardly. We went to Hawaii, thanks to my great in-laws. Um, but my suitcase didn't make it to Hawaii. And then Sherry either got sun poisoning or food poisoning or both. So we were a couple of swells over there in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> I'll never forget waking up that morning to my wife with sun poisoning. We thought our luck had turned when we won. We actually won a free helicopter ride through Kauai. Wow. This story, by the way, the helicopter story, is not in the book. It might make book two. Sherry is extremely excited about the helicopter ride because she wants to take pictures. She takes pictures every 10 seconds when she's on a vacation. But three minutes, three minutes before we get onto the helicopter, we discover that they need to distribute our weight with the other couple who also got to ride in the helicopter. They wanted Sherry to sit in the back with the other people and wanted me to sit up front with the pilot. Sherry is disappointed because she's not going to have the best view for her pictures, so she says, Billy, you're going to have to take them. And oh yeah, there's only three pictures left on this roll, so you're going to have to change the film. If you know me, you know that it's not a good idea for me to be trying to change film up in the air in a helicopter. 
but trying to be a good husband for my new wife on our honeymoon, I decide I'll give it a try. She has 35 seconds to teach me how to change the film and her camera that I know nothing about. And so we're up now in the air. It's loud. All of us have those headphones on so we don't go deaf. I take about three good pictures and it's time to change the film. I've got the camera and the new film in my lap, studying it, trying to recall what Sherry said to do, and I feel a tap on my back. Take a picture! Take a picture! I put the film in, wrap one end of it around something and close the lid, and I think I'm supposed to push a button now, but which button? Obviously not the one I pushed, because when I pushed it, I heard this very strange sound. It almost sounded like a camera sucking up film. <laughs> and that's exactly what it was. When I pressed the button, the film went the wrong way. It got sucked up. There was no more film. It was then I felt more tapping on my back. Come on, take a picture, take a picture. Just a minute. And so I'm looking down in my lap at the camera, trying to decide what to do. If I tell Sherry what happened, there could be two possible results. <laughs> One, she will be so sad and disappointed, she won't enjoy the rest of this once-in-a-lifetime experience. Or two, she will be so angry and upset that she may do something that will make us crash. So what would you have done if you were in my shoes? Well, I did what any smart new husband on his honeymoon would do. I pretended to take pictures. I wasn't about to have us all die in a fiery crash. Or was it about to ruin this once-in-a-lifetime trip for Sherry? So I started snapping away. <laughs> got it, got it. When we got down on the ground, out of the helicopter, I broke the news to her, and she handled it better than I thought she would. She did fine. What would you have done? Decisions. Decisions, life is full of them. Hopefully, you don't have to make too many of them 20,000 feet in the air. Some of them are easy decisions. We walk in a room and say a light needs to turn on. Turn, we need more light, so we turn on a light, which is actually a pretty complex and miraculous thing when you think about it that my eyes see a light switch and my brain somehow tells this arm to extend and tells my fingers to flip on a light switch. Pretty incredible. But these are decisions we don't even classify as decisions because they're no-brainers. Somehow we just do them. But life of course, is filled with all kinds of difficult decisions. Should I go to college? Which college should I attend? What job do I accept? Should I move to another city? What doctor is best for me? Should I have that surgery? And when you're married or you're a parent, it's even more challenging because you're trying to help someone else make decisions too. Some of our decisions involve ethics or morals. One of the great resources for moral decisions, of course, is the Bible. Thank goodness we have the Bible to help us and to give us direction. But we have to be careful about how we use the Bible. Remember that the Bible is the Word of God with a capital W and not the words of God with a little w. God didn't dictate the Bible to someone. It has a human influence along with the divine. 
There are a lot of strange things in the Bible, wrong things. Slavery is in the Bible, and in the 1800s, the Methodist Episcopal Church South used those passages to rationalize their ownership of other human beings. It's hard to believe, hard to fathom today, but that's what they did. There are parts of the Bible you have to chalk up to someone's personal opinion, or that the culture was an influence, or that they were just flat out wrong. Paul thought Jesus was coming back during his lifetime or soon after. Don't marry, he said. No need to. You might as well stay single. Uh, The Lord's coming back soon. You also need to know the context in which something was written, especially Paul's writings. Remember, those are all letters to someone. He didn't know that hundreds of years later, people would be reading them and calling them scripture. He wrote them to people in a particular context. It would be like me writing a letter to a friend who was struggling with alcohol and me writing something like, stay away from alcohol. Whatever you do, stay away from it. Alcohol is ruining your life. You've lost your marriage. You've lost your children. Get to AA meetings. Seek counseling. Whatever you do, stay away from alcohol. It is bad for you. Now, what if someone read that letter hundreds of years later and called it Scripture? And people say that the Apostle Billy wrote that no one should drink alcohol. Stay away from it. It's bad for you. You see what I'm getting at? You have to know the context. You have to be careful getting advice from the Bible. When making moral decisions, I think the two best resources in the Bible are the Ten Commandments in the Hebrew Scriptures and the teachings of Jesus in the New Testament. In the very last year of the 19th century, in 1899, a Bible was printed that used red ink for the words Jesus spoke. It caught on, and others did the same thing, and so there are Bibles that have Jesus' words in red. And so if you're serious about following the way of Christ, it's a good idea to be familiar with those red words. Some people call themselves red-letter Christians. I like that. You're on the right path if you're a red-letter Christian, taking seriously the words and the teachings of Christ. But it doesn't solve all our moral decisions for us, does it? For instance, we know that both the Ten Commandments and the teachings of Jesus stressed loving others. That's one of the main teachings. But love them how? When I first moved to New York as a young man, I was so naive. And when I walked down the streets of Manhattan, I tried to give change to every person who asked me for some. And it didn't take me long to realize that this poor, struggling actor Uh, Couldn't keep this up or I'd soon be on the street asking for money too. And what about the person who keeps asking me for money but pretends to be someone else with a different story? And what about the people with addictions or people who just won't make good decisions? Do I keep giving to them? Or is the loving thing actually not to give to them? What's the right thing to do? What's the loving thing to do? Tough decisions. In the newspaper this week, our own Preston Hodges had a really good letter to the editor about finding the truth. Preston's first suggestion for finding truth is to consult a wide variety of sources. 
And he says, the wider the difference in their perspective, the better. Second, he says, from those varying sources, find the ideas of which they agree. As he said, there probably won't be too many of those. Third, those things on which they agree are very possibly, maybe even probably, the truth. And finally, he says, keep your intellectual door open enough to accept new information that might come down the pike that might cause you to question your truth. Good article, Preston. Good thoughts. Those are good ideas for finding truth, and they can also be good steps to take when making tough decisions. But no matter what steps we take, no matter what formulas we use, we can always second-guess ourselves. That's okay, Brantley. Get back to that thumb, buddy. <laughs> you know, we often, no matter what decisions we make, we often second-guess ourselves. And we could beat ourselves up wondering, did I choose the right university? Did I choose the right major, the right job? Was moving to Savannah really the right decision? Or moving from Savannah to a new place? Sometimes there are no easy answers and no formulas. And honestly, there often is not a right answer. But we're still wondering, is it the right thing for us, for me, for you? Here's what I suggest. When I have difficult decisions to make, I do better when I step back from it when I create some space and go to Gethsemane for prayer and reflection. And Gethsemane can look like a lot of places. It can look like your bedroom or a garden, a beach, a mountainside, or even the inside of a Honda. I encourage you to find your place and space and reflect on whatever situation you are wrestling with. And this is really not my suggestion. It's Jesus' suggestion. It's what he did time and time and time again. And I encourage you during this time to open and close this time in Gethsemane by saying something called, the Jesus Prayer. You know, I got to thinking about this. I don't think in all my years at Asbury, I don't ever remember mentioning the Jesus Prayer to you. I'm sorry about that. It's an ancient, ancient prayer. It at least goes to the fifth century. Some believe it goes all the way back to the origin of the church, and it really probably did. There are different variations of it but it basically goes like this. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Make haste to help me. Do your will in my life. That's it. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Make haste to help me. Do your will in my life. Those of you who are familiar with the 12-step programs probably resonate with this prayer because it offers many of the same feelings and thoughts about, uh, that the 12-step programs offer about needing God, being dependent on God, and giving our will to God's will. And I think this prayer does go all the way back to the early church because it's what Jesus did. He used this prayer just instead of saying, Lord Jesus Christ, he said, Abba, Father. 
And so I encourage you to pray this prayer over and over again, hundreds of times. Use it as a chant so it becomes like breathing in and breathing out. And as I start this new church year, I plan to do this. And I encourage you to use the Jesus prayer over and over and over again. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Say it. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Make haste to help me. Make haste to help me. Do your will in my life. Do your will. And the goal is this, that we will trust God more and more. That no matter what tough decision we have to make, there is no crisis because we know that we can trust God to take us, to hold us, and resurrect us. Amen and amen.